Abu Sam Hassan Spiker is a philosopher and comparative scholar of Islamic, Greek, and modern thought. He is the son of Anglo American converts to Islam, members of a trailblazing group uh, who, in their 1970s, 70s communes, initiated some of the first experiments in the revival of traditional structures of Islamic knowledge and Sufism within the desacralized context of the modern West. Desacralized? No, desacralized. Yeah, uh, do sacralized, not sacralized. <laughs> um, uh, also, Sant's uh, mother, many of you will know, as she translated the Bawla Sharifa, uh, MashaAllah Ta'ala, uh, Sheikh Aziz Azbaika, uh, Hafidah Allah Ta'ala. And so, uh, uh, you know, he, he, growing up in a rich spiritual and intellectual home environment, uh, Sant Hassan Azbaika spent 12 years studying the Islamic sciences in the Middle East, primarily under the tutelage of the great Iraqi Sayyid and theologian, Sheikh Asai, uh, Sayyid Qusay in Jordan. Um, in the course of his studies, uh, Osam Hassan principally focused on interactions between the school of Sheikh Al-Akbar ibn Arabi, uh, about whom he's going to be speaking tonight, and the late Kalam theology or theological tradition, and also completed his memorization of the Quran. Uh, when he came back, he completed his MPhil at Cambridge, focusing on uh, a number of different philosophers. I'm not going to list out all of the names, but you can imagine many of the great philo uh, philosophers of the West, as Kant, Hegel, etc. Uh, under the guidance of Professor Douglas Headley, a renowned scholar of Platonism and German idealism, and one of the key contemporary proponents of Platonism as a living tradition. Um, so I'm going to just skip through some of this, but for his thesis on the relationship between Platonic hierarchy and Enlightenment conceptions of individual self-determination, Ustad Hassan Spiker received a distinction and faculty prize from the University of Cambridge. MashaAllah. Uh, from 2014 to 2022, Ustad Hassan Spiker was a researcher on Taba Foundation's flagship classification of the sciences project. Many of you would have seen the symposiums in Cambridge that took place, and also his book that came out, Nafsul Amr, Things As They Are, uh, and also a critique of Kant's, um, which some of you I know are passing around. So that's also uh, out there. Uh, widely lauded as one of the most significant contemporary attempts to renew the epistemological and metaphysical foundations of traditional Islamic philosophical thought. His main area of study in Islamic thought is the intersection of Ilm al-Kalam, Muslim theology, uh, Abbasidal philosophy, and Ilm al-Tahqiq, i.e. experiential metaphysics, or the metaphysics largely uh, discussed by the Sufis. In Greek thought, the Neoplatonic critique of Aristotelian immanentism, and in modern thought, the philosophy of Kant, the metaphysics of freedom, and the possibility of metaphysics. He joined Zaytuna College in uh, Berkeley, California, as a lecturer in philosophy and logic, in 2022, um, and also I was told to, uh, to make sure I mention your honourable mother Sadie uh, for the translation of the Bodla. Uh, personally, Ustad Hassan, yeah, I'm very honoured to say, is one of my teachers. It's the opposite way around. From whom I've benefited hugely. We're very, very honoured here. Uh, you know, a big uh, thank you to Mona Asim uh, for also making this happen, and uh, I was honoured to be a part of that as well to get Ustad Hassan for the Baraka in our town. Uh, a town which is small in terms of its geographical size, but big in terms of its spirit and soul. And so very, very honoured to have Ustad Hassan Spiker. There's a lot of these young lads here that you can see, say, the, uh, from the Kareem of Madrasa, etc. MashaAllah. And the reason why that's important, even though I'm sure some of the things that Ustad Hassan is going to say today will definitely be above um, you know, many of our pay grades, but it's important to know that these are the sort of people that we have Alhamdulillah, our mashaykh, our teachers that are there at the forefront, that are not wasting their time, but are utilizing it for the sake of servitude to this deen in its intellectual and spiritual traditions. So for me personally, I'm very, very honored to be uh, to hosting you, Sayyidi. Allah yubarak feekum, and I know that I everybody is very, very excited. Many people that have registered and signed up online that couldn't be here in person. So on behalf of everybody, we thank you very much, Sayyidi, for coming. Tonight's uh, talk, just before I hand over this mic, is about Ibn Arabi. Some of you may have heard of him from the Ertrul show where he makes an appearance uh, as the Sheikh of Ertrul Bay. No problem. Uh, but Ibn Arabi is one of the greatest intellectual minds that perhaps is one of the most influential scholars uh, and sages of Islam that influenced the last six, seven hundred years of the Islamic tradition beyond absolute comprehension. And so to learn something about him, 
And when they're taught in our tradition, عِنْدَ ذِكَرَ الصَّالِحِينَ تَتَنَزَّلُ الرَّحْمَةِ That when the righteous are mentioned, Allah's mercy descends. We can see that mercy in the form of the rain outside. And so we're very grateful to be mentioning the Shaykh Al-Akbar in this majlis, inshaAllah ta'ala. Thank you. Barakallahu alaykum. Thank you for that very generous inter- uh, introduction, which I'm ashamed to say I actually wrote. <laughs> It's the first time that's ever been revealed. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim bi'an wa'aikam ala atika fi jami'a tajalliyatika ala seyyidina wa maulana muhammadin awwal al-anwar al-fa'id azim al-buhuri azamat al-zad al-mutahakiqi fi alamay al-butuni wa al-zuhuri bima'an al-asma'i wa sifat fa huwa awwal uhamadin wa mutahabbidin manwa al-ibadati wa al-qurbat والممد في عالم الأرواح والأشباح لجميع الموجودات وعلى آله وأصحابه صلاة تكشف لنا النقابا وجه الكريم في المراء والأقضات وتعرفنا بك وبه في جميع المرات والحضرات والطف بنا يا مولانا بجاهه في الحركات السكنة واللحظات والخطرات والطف بنا يا مولانا بجاهه في الحركات السكنة واللحظات والخطرات والطف بنا يا مولانا بجاهه في الحركة السكنة والله ذات الخضر سبحان ربك رب العزة والحسن سلام على المسيح الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمت إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما أنفعنا أنفعنا بما علمت ما زلنا من فضلك علم ولا تعليم إنك على كل شيء قدير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله I'm very profoundly unworthy to be speaking to you about this topic um, and I'm very grateful to Mullah Shams who the opposite is true, is absolutely one of my teachers and is a proper sheikh, and I'm just a fake sheikh, but uh, so it can't be that way around. But um, in any case, uh, Al Sheikh Al Akbar is of such tremendous importance in our particular time, and I think the relevance has to be in our particular time. This is not an exercise in history or triumphalism about our tradition, how wonderful it is, but it is that wonderful, but triumphalism doesn't help anyone. The question that we want to answer is, how should we realize the haqqaiq of the deen in ourselves, and how should we convey that to others? Now, we can't convey it to others before we've realized it, that's a problem, otherwise we're just, just empty words, hashakum, which empty verbiage, which doesn't come from the heart, and words which don't come to the heart, from the heart, don't reach the heart. And so if you're finding it doesn't reach your heart, I'm afraid I'm, it's, I'm responsible, and do forgive me. But what I found in my own life, what my parents found when they encountered the dean, is that this is a window, the last window, the last door, the last means available to humankind to come to true knowledge of the nature of reality and of the true nature of human nature. What are we as human beings? What is this extraordinary being which is the meeting place of the angelic and the animal? Because most of us go through life not realizing what we are, right? Most of us plow through life not realizing. Our so the, why is it that we go along not knowing what we are, not knowing our secret? Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Habib said, Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Habib said, were human beings, were man, to know the serenity, the bliss of his secret, he would shed a tear with every breath. My man to know the serenity of his secret, he would shed a tear with every breath. But we go through life getting upset about small things and oh, I don't have this and I don't have We're all the same. We all go through, we all have those challenges. But what we have inside of us is a divine mystery, of course it goes without saying, I don't mean divine in that sense, a divine mystery, a mystery which was placed there by the Lord of all being, by the real, and 
he placed us as Khilafa, as he istikhlaf, he, he placed us as the Khalifa of his creation. And as such, to be Khalifa of the creation, we must span all of the creation. That's why we contain within ourselves all of the worlds. Human beings span all of the different worlds. The animal kingdom is stuck in the world of impulse, stuck in the world of instinct, right? And we also have impulse and instinct, right? But the angels are in the world of spiritual reality, in the world of unseen to us reality, in the world of pure intellect, right? And they exist in a state of pure obedience to Allah Ta'ala, not having free choice. It's not that they have free choice and they only obey. They don't have free choice. They have to obey. That's their nature. Their nature is simply to obey. We as human beings are unique amongst all of the worlds in that we have a composite nature. We are partly from the animal world and we're partly from, as it were, the angel not literally, but as it were from the angelic world. And we have the, tr we have the task to order the aspects of our being. We must, we can't not. That's our existential condition. We can't choose not to order the aspects of our being. Imam Ghazali said we're forced to be free. Mm. Right? Imam Ghazali said we're forced to be free. We can't choose not to be in this existential condition. But we can block out the angelic, the metaphysical, the spiritual, and pretend it's not there. And that's the atheist. That's the Richard Dawkins of this world. May Allah guide you. Not much hope of, of it, but Allah can do anything. Allah guide him. That's kufr. What is the origin of the term kufr? It means to cover over, right? To cover over reality. As in the reality is there, but we choose not to see it. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Shaitan فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يُكَذِّبُونَكُ وَلَكِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ يَجْحَدُونَ Even the mushrikun of Mecca, they could see that the Prophet ﷺ was who he said that he was. There was part of them that, could, that recognized that reality. But they couldn't integrate that with their overall view of the world. They couldn't integrate that with, what, what if I lose my position in the dunya? They couldn't integrate that with fear of losing their place in the dunya, their place in dunya. And so they covered it over. They covered over that. They said, oh, I didn't see that. No, no, I didn't see that. I didn't see that truth. They deny to themselves and they live in a state of denial. Right? But the reality is human beings will always ask those ultimate questions about the nature of reality, because that's our nature. That's where we come from, right? That is the, the, the nature of our lofty spirit that Allah Ta'ala breathed into, right? That is the nature of our lofty spirit, is that we are already in contact with spiritual reality. That is our nature, but we are veiled by the veils of our corporeal instantiation, having come into these bodies, Allah Ta'ala placed us in this corporeal, this physical world. And that veils that direct perception of reality, which is our birthright. Allah created us with that unique istiadad, or capacity, to have that spiritual knowledge and awareness of the haqqaiq of things. And so, this is our fundamental unique nature as human beings that we bridge the realm of the angelic and the animal. We are the barzakh between the two of them. And that's why we're uniquely capable of being the khalifa because we look after all of the worlds, mm. right? We have a part, there's a part of us from all of the worlds. Reality becomes ordered in us, mm. in our ordering, 
which we can't not do. And most of us, unfortunately, we say the spiritual is too difficult. Uh, unlocking the secrets is too difficult. Reading the Qur'an and really understanding the, the fullness of its revelation is too difficult. So we'll go for the impulse. We'll go for just having a superficial relationship to the deen. We'll go for just parroting slogans, but not really trying to internalize the purification of the heart that we're commanded to do in the Qur'an and not really internalize the aqidah and say this is not just repeating a bunch of stuff which we in some identitarian fashion you know I was born a Muslim it makes sense to me it fits in with my lifestyle that's all the people I know therefore I'm a Muslim no that's not what tasdeel is in fact may, many of our ulama said that such a person is not even a mu'min now Rahmat and some of the other ulama said there's more nuance to it than that but there has to be tasdeel which means that you actually have to look at the evidence and find that there's a seeing which is consequent of the evidence. That you've seen all of the evidence and then, oh, I find that I see that it's true. I can see directly that it's true. That's ascent. That's tasdeel. It's something which happens to you when you look at the evidence. It's not an act of will that I will believe, as in the Christian idea that you have this absurdity and these series of absurdities and the person in the Billah said, well, I will abide, no, it's absurd, but I will choose to believe in that, right? So unreflective faith is not acceptable in our deen. And don't think that people in the past were all doing taqlid. They were living and breathing Islam as an experiential reality. But now we've fallen into the issue that we accept because we grow up in this culture, and I did, and we all did. We grow up in this culture, we accept a batil view of the nature of faith itself. Does Iman in our religion mean blind faith? Right? I'm getting you all ready to hear about Ibn Arabi. Does, 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 does Iman in our religion mean blind faith? But the conception of faith, which is refuted by the atheist, is blind faith. I'll, that someone can believe in something without evidence. That's the vision of faith. Whereas our vision of faith is that faith is synonymous with knowledge. Faith is a seeing into the nature of reality, which can increase and increase and increase and corresponds with the purification of the soul. So what did... As Shaykh al-Akbar Mahidin ibn al-Arabi, which as Mullah Shams said, we are hoping to receive some of his barakat just by mentioning his name. What is his very important role in the world that we're living in today, especially? As I said at the beginning, he has a very, very special role today. We can mention, just to get the barakat, all of the great saints of Imam al-Badawi, and Imam al dasuqi and Imam Shadali, and Imam Najmadin al Kubra, and Abdul Qadir al Jilani, and all of the great saints. And that's a beautiful thing. But Ibn Arabi, for me, has a different role. And this has been brought home to me not only by my humble attempts to read and understand him, my sitting with those who are true inheritors of al-Shaykh al-Akbar, Qadisallahu, Sirrahu. But also, hearing again and again, so that it becomes almost mutawatir, that the West will open their hearts to Islam through Ibn Arabi. That the West, from, from Sufi Shaykh after Sufi Shaykh, you hear that this Sufi Shaykh, who's known for his piety and for his miracles and for his iltizam bishara and for his istiqama and for his baraka says, even if he's not an Akbarian in that sense, whatever that is, it, he says the West will open its heart to Islam through Ibn Arabi again and again. Now why is this? 
This is because this world has become obsessed with the mind, the linear mind, the instrumental mind, trying to use the mind to manipulate nature, trying to use the mind to achieve dunyawi goals in this modern science and technology. But it's completely lost the spirit, right? And those who try to prove the existence of the spirit just through that same type of mental gymnastics of logic chopping, right, don't really convince the Westerners because they say, well, you can do that as much as you want. I'll never admit that that chain of reasoning is going to uncover the reality of something metaphysical. And that's because of the specific nature of the deterioration of Western thought. But what is the reality that Ibn Arabi gives the Westerners? The, the reality that he gives is he had opened to him such an extraordinary, broad, direct vision of reality that he saw within his spiritual vision the full nature of the aql itself. He, he saw within his spiritual vision, the full nature of the aql itself. And this is why you find in his work such a profundity. Why do they call him Shaykh al-Akbar, the greatest Shaykh? There are so many different reasons. Again, it's not a dogmatic statement. Some people get upset because saying he's the greatest Shaykh. How do you know he's the greatest Shaykh? No, it's a laqa. It's a title right, that he has. Al-Shaykh al-Akbar. Right? Now, but for those who believe that he is the greatest shaykh, the generations after him called him al-shaykh al-kabir. Right? So again, it's not this, it's not a, a descriptive sense in some dogmatic, you have to believe that al-shaykh al-akbar. But what you should understand from that is he has a very, very special status amongst many of the great mahakakun. Right? And this is because there's been no one in the history of our ulama who has encompassed so many different dimensions of human experience, all of them. And I said before that the human being is a composite. And indeed, we're a composite of the bodily world, the spirit, and the mind. And you might say it all becomes gathered together in the heart. Right? Now, each of these different dimensions has a science. And usually the ulama would have an exceptional focus on one or another of these dimensions. So many of the great Mutasawifa, for example, had very profound spiritual experience and experiences in their halwas, right? But they had maybe only a modicum of book learning, or perhaps they knew lots of fiqh, but they didn't understand anything about the aqliya, and were even... Uh, about the rational sciences, the intellectual sciences, and we're even tempted to deny their importance or the, their efficacy. And some were, to a large degree, unfortunately, rejected the immense plenitude of the meadows of the spirit and the fact that one drop from that ocean is enough to make the person who receives that meadow to think that everything else is paltry in... in but, the, but for those who reject that, they don't even know that it exists. And they think they can judge it by that which is lesser and more paltry. They can judge the higher by that which is lesser. And so they tended to be focused on what were called the outward sciences. And so there's lots of variation. But what Sheikh al-Akbar very uniquely brought was this gathering of all of the dimensions of that human composite, all of the reality of our being the meeting place of the angelic and the animal in a totally realized fashion. So I'll give you an example. Today, we are facing an onslaught. I'm allowed to say this. I'm allowed to say this because I'm, I'm running to the airport after this. <laughs> I'm worried about you, but forgive me. I hope you don't get in trouble as long as I get to the airport. Anyway. <laughs> We're facing this onslaught from the LGBTQ plus, what is, what is it now? IA or something? IA? 
I don't know, I never found out what the IA was. But anyway, that's what we've got to now. So we'll just call them the lesser people, <laughs> because you can obviously keep on adding on letters, which I think they'll probably do for a very, very long time. They don't have, seem to have any shame. Um, you know, perhaps it will be the whole alphabet. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But why is Sheikh al-Akbar so important? Do you know Sheikh al-Akbar uniquely is able to answer those people completely so that they can't say another word, right? And that's because Sheikh al-Akbar encompasses in his spiritual vision all of philosophy, but he's not doing taklid of philosophy as, as usually understood because he's seeing it in vision. He's seeing it in vision. And we'll back up to a bit more of an introduction about him in a moment. But was, he's seeing it in vision, right? He's not learning philosophy through, well, I had this teacher of philosophy and he taught me a bit about Aristotle and then, you know, step by step. He's seeing reality by God's grace in direct witnessing. And so his vision of reality is not limited to these categories of being which can't make, can only make sense of some things, not others. Most of the philosophers in our tradition, for example, are Aristotelian. Now, if you try and explain gender in an Aristotelian framework, you can't make any sense of it. It's not a substance, right? It's not, it's not a substance, and it's not an accident. And so people try to explain it in, in ways which most people today will find very unconvincing. What Sheikh al-Akbar says is, gender is just a manifestation in this lower world of a, of a principle of gender. It's not gender like male and female, but of a principle of gender which is part and parcel of the metaphysical world, which is native to the metaphysical world. And that is fi'al and infi'al. It's the, the active principle of existence and the affective principle of existence, right? That which is active and passive, that which is acts upon and is affected and out of the union of these two principles you have a generation in the sense of generation in the sense of production generation of a new level of being right and so these realities in this world they reflect something intrinsic to reality right and so they can't simply be played with it's not simply reconfiguring physical structure and so on. And so that's just one example. It's something I happen to have been working on recently. I don't mean to advertise my forthcoming uh, book and article. With, but in any case, um, so that's just one pressing example where the point is we're not here to just be defensive. We're not here just to apologize. We're not here just to moralize. It's not enough to just tell the kafir that you are disgusting, uh, you are wrong, this is outrageous. This is... That doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help you understand why you're upset. And it doesn't understand, help the kafir to understand why you're upset and why he's wrong. We're here, if we have this access to reality, and it's not blind faith on their model, we have access to reality, and we have access to the, the fullness of human nature, the truth of human nature, we should be here to heal. We should be here to see other human beings who are lost, by no fault necessarily of their own, and that we, by the pure grace and generosity of Allah, have this means, these keys to extraordinary knowledge and truth, we should be here to heal. Um, and people like Ibn Arabi, because they have such an expansive view of reality, they have the means to give people complete answers and full answers. So, Mawlana al Sheikh al Akbar Ibn Arabi was born in 1165. Many people would date that to the same year that. Sheikh al-Qadr al-Jilani died. And 
he lived through an extraordinary time, which is very instructive for us, because he lived through a time in which Islam was under attack from every side. So Islam was under attack in Spain, where he was born, in Murcia. And if you, if you know about Los Rosales, the, the kind of Muslim village of Los Rosales in Spain, it's right next to Murcia, just a few, a stone's throw from where the Sheikh al Akbar was born. And he was living at the, during the, 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 the beginnings of the so called reconquest of Spain. And it was actually in his lifetime, shortly before he, he passed away, that Cordoba was finally taken. And shortly after his death, his native Seville was sadly retaken. Not retaken, taken. I didn't say retaken. I'm, I'm brainwashed. It's not retaken. <laughs> yeah, taken. And at the same time, he lived at the intersection of all these extraordinary people. He lived when Salahuddin al-Ayyubi anhu, took back Jerusalem. And he also saw it taken again. And a very interesting thing for those who think he was some sort of universalist is that he said, now that it's back in Christian hands, it's haram to mm. even go there because you'll be under their jurisdiction. Mm. Right? And he said that, not something you necessarily want to hear, but he said, living amongst the Kafar is absolutely haram. There's no wedge to it whatsoever. So that's interesting for a perennialist, isn't it? I was just reading that in the Wasaya the other day. I was like, oh, it's not a perennialist. I already knew he was a perennialist, but I was like, what are these? They must be out of their minds. There's no hint of it anywhere. This is the most absolutist Muslim in the whole history of Islam. And it was the time when Salahuddin Ayyubi retook Jerusalem. And then it was taken again. And it was a time in which the Mongols started to move across Asia. And they didn't make it to Baghdad within his lifetime. Because that's 1258, isn't it? But I was asking my historian friend. But the... Melana Yusuf. Oh, but, um, but he died in 1240. But they'd made it to Iran by that time. So he lived in this very tumultuous time. Suhrawardi al-Maqtul was killed during his lifetime. Francis of Assisi, not Saint Francis of Assisi, was, came to Egypt to make his dawah at that time. And he met some of the great A'imma, Najmuddin al-Kubra. Najmuddin al-Kubra was alive and died during his lifetime. One of the great A'imma of Tasawwuf, one of the great founders of the Turuq. He met, some people question this, but he's, the, the mashur position is that he met one of the great A'imma of Tasawwuf, Imam Sahrawardi, Shahabuddin Sahrawardi. And... Is it Shehabedin? I'm getting mixed up with the other one. Anyway, maybe they're both, they, could they both be called Shehabedin? One's Omar. Oh, Omar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's, very, it's not Shehabedin, it's Omar. And uh, he, he is supposed to have met him. And they sat together, apparently these two great Aimma of Tasawwuf. They came into the room. And those observing them said, they sat there, they didn't say a word to each other for two hours. They were just there. And then they came out and they said, what did you think? Why didn't you say anything? What, what did you think? He said, Sheikh Al-Akbar said, he is dressed from head to toe in the prophetic norm, in the Sunnah. And the other one said, Imam Sahrawadi said, he's an ocean of divine secrets. So, Sheikh Al-Akbar, at a very young age, he had an incredible jazz to the haqqa'iq. And as I said, it, this is a consequence of, of our nature. What is fundamental to our nature is that spirit. That spirit is already in touch with the divine reality. That's its nature. Its nature is to, is to know the divine, to be haunted 
in the best possible sense, by the reality of the divine. To never be able to forget there's something, there's something deeper than this everyday life, there's something I'm remembering. And he found this extraordinary jazz at a very young age, so he became very well known because at the age of 15 he put himself into halwa, they say in a graveyard, and had one of the most extraordinary fats, fat. I tried to make that into a plural in English, it didn't work well. Fat has foot right? In, in the history of the Sawuf. And a fat is an opening into witnessing divine reality. As I said, it's always there nagging in the background. You, we have glimpses, of, we have hints of that Islam is more than just blind faith, that there is something extraordinary, there's something profound, there is something much more to human nature. There's something much more than everyday life. But the person who has a fatah is someone who suddenly witnesses this reality and they, it makes sense. It's not a hallucination. A hallucination doesn't make sense of your everyday life. But suddenly they realize, oh, the true nature of everyday life is this. We're in a state of taklif. We're in a state of moral responsibility. We're moving towards the akhirah. We are supposed to be the khalifa of Allah Ta'ala in this realm, we have this important mission, this lofty purpose, and they see that, right? And they see into things which are usually unseen. Unseen is a relative term, right? Unseen to what? Right? We right now are unseen to everyone outside, right? We're the unseen to them. It's a relative term. It's not an absolute relative term, but in any case. So... He had this extraordinary effect, and he became known to his community. His father was a prominent political figure, and he knew many of the great figures of the time. And he was a friend of, his father was a friend of, of, of Ibn Rushd, the famous philosopher, another contemporary, Averroes. It was a very rich time, very tumultuous time. You, you know, Islam was suddenly under attack, having been untouchable. Suddenly it was under attack from every side. And there's a very famous meeting which we know to be authentic, so it's extraordinary. It's very famous between these huge, two huge figures. Ibn Arabi, who represents in people's minds this kind of mystical figure, and which is really not... I mean, depends what you mean by mystical, but it can be very misleading, and we'll get to that. This, this great mystical figure, and Ibn Rushd, who's this paradigmatic rationalist, uh, as we understand. Of course, he wasn't really, because no pre-modern people were rationalist in the Enlightenment way. He believed in revelation, for one thing. He believed in spiritual experience. And interesting, interestingly, he believed in the possibility of that direct witnessing of spiritual reality, even though he said he hadn't experienced it himself. But Ibn Arabi reports that when he met Ibn Rushd, or perhaps it was Ibn Rushd talking to his father, I can't quite remember, but beforehand, but it, he said, I believe that, I know that this is possible, I know that this can take place, but I didn't think I'd ever hear about or meet someone in my time who'd really had this complete opening. So he asked, he said, can I meet your son? I'd really love to be. So these are very, very, very illustrious philosopher who's much, much older but he really wants to meet, he's very curious. Yeah. And there's a famous meeting that takes place where they say, you know, stuff that we can't understand. But I'll, I'll, give, you a, I'll give you a basic, a basic account of what happened. Is apparently, according to Sheikh Lakbar's account, uh, Ibn Arabi came in and Ibn Rushd strode over and he came up to him and he said, yes. And Ibn Arabi said, yes. <laughs> and Ibn Rush was happy. He said, oh. And then Ibn Arabi said, no. And Ibn Rush's face fell. Right? That's apparently, that, that's, that's supposedly the account of what happened. <laughs> so they have these very elevated meanings. You know, you've got, you've got his meeting with Suhrawadzi and But the account of that is that he said, yes, do the, do the results of 
speculative investigation, of rational investigation, concord? Do they agree with what you have witnessed in your mystical unveiling? And he said, yes. And he was very happy. He said, well, I haven't been wasting my time. And then he said, no. Right? But on the other hand, they don't. There's another very important dimension which they don't. And he said, between the yes and no, souls take flight from their bodies. And he said a lot of other things which are above our pay grade, as you were mentioning. But, um, how should I come? We're above my pay grade. But in any case, this is an extraordinary and very elevated figure. At a certain point, he went on an almighty siyaha, such as the world has never seen. He left Al Andalus and he travelled all around the world. And just before he left, he was on the coast of Spain, Al Andalus, Al Habib. He was on the coast of Spain and he had a famous vision where he saw his entire life that was to come and all of his major companions, including Sadr al Qurnawi's father and Sadr al Qurnawi himself, who would be his great companion. And then, of course, everything unfolded as he had seen. And he ended up telling Sadr al Qurnawi about these, this vision. Sadr al Qurnawi was his great successor from Konya. And if you know a bit about geography, you'll know that that's a long, long way away from Al-Andalus. So Al-Sheikh Al-Akbar went on the ultimate siyaha. And he first went to... One of the first places that he stayed in was Fez. And he has a very, very famous sojourn in Fez where he had openings into reality. Now, what is this thing about openings? It sounds very subjective. And Do, do we just have to believe? You don't have to believe anything. It's not our leader. But why does someone who has these openings, anyone can claim them, right? I mean, I could claim that I had lots of openings. I mean, I wouldn't encourage you to believe me. The, 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 what, what difference would it make? What, what is the difference? The difference is, Sheikh Al-Akbar's openings, the way he, what he describes, goes on to be witnessed by all those who follow in his path. Right? They go on to read his works and recognize those experiences. They go on to find that what didn't make sense to them about their own experiences, oh, I look in Sheikh Al-Akbar and I find clarity. I suddenly understand mm. what I've experienced. Right? He becomes a guide for all those who want to understand their experience, make sense of, their, of, of reality as a whole. What you have to remember about Sheikh al is not commonly thought, he was a huge alim, a huge alim. Some people say, which is not really the case, some say he was a much dead mutlaq. I don't believe that personally. Uh, most of the alim are but it is, a, it is a, a claim that some make. But certainly he studied, there's not an alim on the face of the earth today, Forgive me to any huge alamat watching, which I, I, I'm sure there's, there's a great many other than the ones I know about. But there's not an alam on the face of the earth who goes anywhere near the level of knowledge that he had. And we, we call him a mystic. Right, we call him a mystic. This is the first level of misunderstanding. And did he all know it in the Khalwa? No. He went and studied with all of the great of his time that he could find. And he was very humble in that regard. He would seek out the greatest masters of all of the different haloom. And his asanid bear, and his ijazat bear testimony to that fact. And he went from Fez and he was in Tunis and he ended up visiting Cairo and he visited Baghdad where he is thought to have met Sahrawardi. And he eventually settled in Damascus, very famously. And that's where he's now buried. Now, he is known as Sheikh al-Akbar because he, un he, he made sense. Because of his all-encompassing nature as a human being, he made sense of spiritual experience in a, what you might call a philosophical vision of the world, like no one before him. 
and no one really after him to the same degree. There are many greats in our tradition, but no one quite to the same degree. And so you talk about the Akbarian system, right, and there's the, these levels of reality, and there's this world and that world and so on. But this is making, why is he so widely accepted by the Sufis? He's so widely accepted by the Sufis because they have always had these wadidat, these experiences, these kushafat of the nature of reality. But he put it into it because his cash was so vivid and clear. He put it into a system in which everything, and the system is not the right word, but for want of a better word, he put it in a system in, in which everything and its relation, relationship to the other level could make perfect sense even in, in the terms of the philosopher. So the philosopher tries to say, well, what is the nature of this reality? Is there a metaphysical reality? Is it just this physical reality? Are there levels of being, i.e., is like this world of the physical, of physical being is just one level of being? Are there, let's say, incorporeal spiritual worlds where angels exist? And so on. The philosopher and philosophers throughout history have tried to determine what exists. What does this existence contain? What are the types of beings which exist? Right? But they're using their limited capacities. They're, they're, they're limited by the limitations of their own aql, the limitations of their own mind. The fact that the mind cannot see all things. It can infer and deduce things about metaphysical reality, but it can't actually see them. So why is Ibn Arabi so revered by so many today? Well, they have philosophical questions and they go to him even though he's supposed to be a mystic and they find the answers that they haven't found anywhere else. Right? So he had <laughs> access and there are particular moments in his biography where it, it, they can be fairly accurately dated that he gained access to this spirituality, this, this spiritual reality, that he gained access to the world of symbols, the world of sim symbolic representations, that he gained access to the world of pure meanings, for example. And it all perhaps sounds very mystical and beyond practical application and beyond our, our pay grade again, but, and, and it is. So what is the point of revering such a figure? The point is realizing that our deen is the truth and that it has achieved the very highest level of ex explanation of reality and the truth that is humanly possible. And that the figures that we have in our tradition, frankly, and this is without prejudice, other traditions can't even begin to imagine. And that is in virtue of really the most important thing I want to say of all, by far, which is Ibn Arabi is not interested in any of these things because they sound clever or mystical or exciting. Or He's interested in this because all he cares about all he loves, all he wants, is something entirely different, which I'm about to explain. When I, I was lucky to be taken to his maqam as a child, many, many years ago, but I remember going, once I had made the decision to, I hate to use the word, ter the term become religious, um, as if the religious are this different, category of being and other Muslims aren't religious, they re become religious. We're all, all Muslims are Muslims. It's not a, a different category, a different species. But once I had decided to pay much more attention to the deen and I set off on that path of Talab al-Ilm, of seeking knowledge, I, and seeking realization, I one of the things I did is I went to Syria, I went to various places. One of the places I visited was the maqam of Sheikh al-Akbar. And I'd been taught my own family to revere him. The books that my parents had in the house were 
full of praise of this man. But my conception of him was he was this kind of mystical, occult, esoterist, kind of the, you know, the inner secrets of the universe type person. I was like, oh, this is exciting. So I went to, I went to his maqam and I was thinking, oh gosh, I'm finally in the presence of the great kind of mystical, esoteric master. And it's like, I don't feel anything. And like, I'm not resonating with this place. I've waited so, so long to come to. And you know, he's like, a group. he's the greatest, and he's a mystic, and he's the secret properties of letters, and you know, he's the great mystic. Nothing was happening, and I, I felt the same dryness that I'd felt before. And then I simply started doing prayer on the Prophet. And the moment I did that, suddenly everything changed. And suddenly I realized this man couldn't care less about all that other stuff. He has fanat in the Prophet. All he cares about is the Prophet. Everything he does is because of recognition of who the Prophet was. The perfect man. The real bridge between God and the world. Right? And when I realized that, suddenly I connected to the reality of this man. And this is what I want to get across to you, is that these great awliya of our tradition, all they are is inheritors of the Prophet Wasallam. All they are is inherited the Prophet. The Prophet is, um, is at such a different level, even though these awliya are very great, that they're almost a different of kind. But of course the Prophet is, is a human being. He's just a human being of such a superior nature, such an extraordinarily superior nature, such an oceanic nature, such a great nature that we could spend a lifetime finding out about his inward and out reality and never be, begin to scratch the surface because his Lord is constantly raising his station forever and ever. And this is the importance of these people. It's not to be a war and mystery. We've got our own philosopher who says, who cares? All we care about is the reality of the Prophet Islam. Because when you begin to encounter just the merest breath of that reality, you realize that there's nothing else that has any importance except following this man inwardly and outwardly, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he is the beloved of Allah Ta'ala. He is the exemplar of perfect human nature. He is the healing to all of the world. He is the mercy to all of the world. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabi ajma'in, sallam alayhi wa sallam, alhamdulillah wa sallam, forgive me for Ali'atala and thank you very, very much indeed. Of course, that's what. Zafla here. Yeah, the most contentious types of issues that people from the outside, when they look at his life and they find him contentious, what mm. might those be? Very good. Very good question, um, Marlena. Um, yes, one has to realize that in different historical epochs, different figures can accrue these different statuses. So if you went to a certain period in the Ottoman world and said Ibn Arabi's contentious, they'd say, no, he's Sultan al-Arafin. There's not, nothing contentious about him. Um, whereas at a similar time, Ibn Taymiyyah would have been, well, he was actually a completely forgotten figure at that time. No one really would have spoken of, about him at all, but there are many periods in which he would have been considered completely beyond the pale. Whereas, more recently, you've, you've had, in certain very influential circles, he's kind of the figure, he's Sheikh al-Islam, right? And so, there are a lot of different reasons for this. So now, nowadays, we find that Ibn Arabi is very controversial. Whereas, if you go back to you know, Ferangi Mahal, the great... Indian ulama, the vast majority of them would consider themselves to be followers of Sheikh al-Akbar. And 
there wasn't this sense of controversy attached to him. So what are, the, what are some of the issues? Well, people have this conception, well, uh, Ibn Arabi is teaching something called the unity of being. And this is very far from what it is, by the way, but what they say, the people who honestly, frankly, don't know at all what they're talking about, they say, well, he's saying that the whole world is God and everything's God and there's nothing but God and you know, everything's God and this uh, plug is God. and Hasha, uh, wakalla. Know, that's not what he says. Nothing like what he says. Nothing to do with what he says. Abaddon. He, Sheikh Al-Akbar does not say the world is God. What he says is the world has no reality except by the will of God and the continual imdad, the continual granting creation, the constant renewal of its, of its existence. It's in Allah Ta'ala's grasp, as it were, that's what, well, you know, Lillah al Mathil Allah, but it's in Allah Ta'ala's grasp, as it were, were you to grasp something, right, it stays, it stays with you as long as you're holding on to it. The moment you let go, it flies away. This world only has being. Because it's in Allah Ta'ala's grasp. And it has no existence outside of that. And were he to let go, mm. it would disappear entirely. Right? It's only existing, constantly dependent in every way on God. Yep. Not only for its existence, but also for its nature, for what it is. It's nothing outside of him. But in no way means it is him. Or, or, or uh, there's an identity between God and the world, that God is the world, or the world is God. Mm. Absolute lies and falsehood, which have happened because many of the expressions of the Sufis are not made for people who don't have a large degree of background. Mm. And so if you go and read the works of the Sufis like a newspaper, then you will come to all sorts of totally mistaken conclusions. And so, there, there are other issues um, which people ascribe to Ibn Arabi, which should be put down to realizing the mistake that is made, that he says certain things that seem to contradict certain aspects of Aqidah. The mistake that people make is saying, oh, Shaykh al Akbar teaches a different aqidah. He doesn't. He teaches exactly the same aqidah. Those are reports of his experiences that do not contradict the aqidah. They constitute, they represent further detailings of the aqidah, further dimensions of depth about the aqidah. They never contradict the aqidah. Right? And they're not put forward as an alternative athlete. He's not saying, now you believe what you find here. He's saying, I experience this mashhad. I witness this reality. And people mistake that for him saying, you must believe something other than what you've been taught to believe, which is not the case. The Bataniya are a, a group of people who are agreed by everyone, not even to be Muslims, and those are people who say, we only outwardly believe all of this stuff, but what we inwardly believe is something completely different. That's just for the awam, that's just for the normal people. And so people make the accusation of Sheikh Akbar that he's a Bhatani. Absolutely not the case. If you read the Futahat al Makiyah, Allah, it is pure Quran and Sunnah and the Prophet and. Uh, good advice and nasiha and wasaya and how to be a fully realized mu'min. That's what it's about. And it also contains asrar and secrets and hidden depths to reality, mostly, which are more, most fundamentally, hidden depths of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, which are hidden from most people. And so if we come 
judging them by our everyday life and saying, well, that sounds to me like it doesn't make sense of what I know, then we immediately do inkar of, of Ibn Arabi and say, well, he's a uh, hasha, far be it from him, he's a zindik or he's a heretic or he's a, all of these terrible things which only harm, sad, he doesn't care, I can promise you that, they, they only harm the the person making the accusations. But yes, today we're in a situation because of our lack of knowledge, because of certain currents which have become dominant in our time, we tend to think of him as a controversial figure. I promise you, there are many phases of Islamic history where he's not remotely controversial, he's simply an imam and people wouldn't hear a, a, word, of, a word against him. One of them is in the time of Ibn Kamal and he said, he was the Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire. He said, I will not hear another word against Sheikh al-Akbar. In fact, anyone who says another word against Sheikh al-Akbar has to have a, a ta'ziyad punishment because I won't put up with it anymore. The, 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 the Prophet of Islam has so many dimensions of depth because he's the perfect man. So we might think we know the Prophet of Islam, but there's much, much more to the Prophet Islam than we know. Now, people like Shaykh Al Akbar, Mahidin Ibn Arabi, Radiallahu they plumbed the depths of that knowledge to a degree which ordinary people weren't able to. And so, having Hasn al for people like that is a good start. Having Su al for people like that is a spiritual darkness, which people won't realize. They think, I'm so clever, I can do a rad on my understanding of what he's saying, but your understanding is your understanding. That's not the reality. Right? So, the great danger is the spiritual harm that Su'adhan, so Hasnadhan is a, is an important start. What the naysayers in our time will say is, you're teaching and maybe you'll have to follow Ibn Arabi and do it. No, we're not. You follow your aqidah, you learn your fardain, you have your spiritual practice, we take care of our families, we live our ordinary lives, we're good to our neighbours, we follow the sunnah and the prophet. There's nothing weird or strange or esoteric. You have to believe anything new. Nothing like that. But having husna dhan of these people who had a profound degree of realisation is very important. And most of our ummah, for most of our history, we've had great husna dhan for these people. One of the darknesses of our time is the fitna of some of these things which call themselves dawah, which have come to say that have come to, to curse the earlier generations and say so we, only we in the 18th century realised that uh, the real deen only we in the 18th century realised the real deen everyone else was uh, there's some few good figures but most of them were much like Kathy <laughs> right uh, so that is just not a good way to and this is the legacy of colonialism we are traumatized mm. in so many ways. It's something deep in our history. I, do, I say that also, I mean, my parents were converts, uh, and I was born a Muslim, but, but I feel that just as much as, as I think anyone else. Um, I've lived that, and you have to realize, I didn't have an easy time, I don't want to do a sub story about myself, but I didn't have an easy time growing up as a Muslim in England, because the, the moment I'd say, my name's Hassan, my parents didn't give me any other name. Alhamdulillah, I'm very glad now that they didn't. It was difficult at the time. The English are very awkward people. The moment I said, my name's Hassan, they're like, oh, gosh, you're a foreigner now. Like, we have to... And there was always this distance. I was always strange. And they would... In any case. So, there, so there was always... But I was very... I'm very glad of that now because it didn't give me the opportunity to just become one of them and forget about everything else. I always had to be very aware of the spiritual legacy that had been given to me. But there are many different dimensions. For someone who has no interest or no opening or no anything or no, they just, I don't know what on earth is all of this stuff about, having husna dhan is important. Mm -hmm. Having su'a dhan is dangerous for your soul. Having husna dhan is good for your soul. And if you have husna dhan, you might find that a little bit of understanding of what all of that stuff is about will open up which will change your life and become the most precious thing to you. What one of the great Sufis said is, if the king, they described to Imam al-Junaid and many others, but if the kings and princes knew what we the Sufis have in our vote, 
they would come with their armies to try to fight us for it, to try and get it. The point being, <coughs> that knowledge, that experience is so precious, nothing in the dunya compares to it. So don't have sort of van. If you don't know what that is, mm -hmm. or you don't, if we don't know what that is, and we don't have a set, don't do inkar arrogantly, because it doesn't fit into my worldview. Mm -hmm. But I'd be open to the idea that there's so much more dimensions of bliss and joy and depth and reality. As Sheikh Muhammad al Habib again said, if man if human beings knew the serenity, the bliss of their own secret, they would shed a tear with every breath. Right? They would shed a tear with every breath. So, but beyond that, no, it's not an aqidah. You don't read Ibn Arabi and say, I'm going to believe this. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, uh, it's not matlub, it's not required from you, it's not asked from you, it's not wanted, it's not good for you to say, I've decided I'm in Ibn Arabi's group, I'm going to be an Ibn Arabi person, let me read the Ibn Arabi, and yes, I believe all of it, I person doesn't understand a word of it, it's like, yeah, believe all that, mm -hmm. yeah, Ibn Arabi, I'm an Ibn Arabi person, they're on Twitter, it's like, I'm an Ibn Arabi person, and they're all about Twitter. <laughs> anyway, so, so, uh, it's a wonderful world. In any case, so, the, 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 that's, that's my message, is that this is this beautiful ummah, the like of which the world has never seen. He's produced these extraordinary people. Allah. It's really, Alhamdulillah. Uh, and now let's do the most important thing, which is Dhikr Allah. Shalla. Yes. Thank you so much. Would you mind if I put a quick ta'aliq on what you said at the end? I, I, I'm just, I, I beg just you. because of what the, the Jew, if you don't mind. Um, you know, uh, Sheikh mentioned about Husna Van. I mean, you've got to remember something. Uh, you've got 600 years of an Ottoman Khilafah, the majority of whom are quote unquote Akbarian, right? Whatever that means. Meaning, at least they accept Ibn Arabi as a great Sheikh. The first madrasa that's ever built in the Ottoman Empire in Iznik, which you can still visit, and I've had the good honor of visiting. It's not a functioning madrasa, they do some calligraphy and stuff there now, unfortunately. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's there. I think other people have been here that are here. Uh, the likes of Ashraf Allah and the great Imams. <coughs> the one that, I mean, Orhan Ghazi, the son of Osman Ghazi, the son of Ertul Ghazi, right? The famous Ertul Ghazi, right? Who builds this madrasa. This is the first official Ottoman madrasa. And the first mudarris, I sort of the, the mudir and the head of the madrasa, is Dawud al Kaysari, who is still buried in his neck, and you can visit him. Yeah. And Kaysari is a student of Kashani, and Kashani, the great Kashani, is a student of Sadruddin Kulani who's obviously the student, and as Sheikh mentioned, of, of Ibn Arabi. So like, for the rest of the, the entire tradition of the Ottoman intellectual tr tradition, at the very the sort of fountainhead is always going to be Ibn Arabi. You can have the Sheikh of Islam Abu Sa'ud Effendi, not the most fond, or perhaps doesn't speak so much about Ibn Arabi, mm. yet his father has a commentary on Ibn Arabi. Right? Uh, the Sheikh mentioned about the, 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 the Indian tradition. They were absolutely all, all of them. But what they did, and what I love, and I'll say this, I, um, if you read for any one of the books of the Farangi Mahadis, anyone, they will always mention this. This is what the Sufi Safiya say, and when they say Sufi Safiya, they basically mean Abdul Rahman Jami, and by extension they mean Ibn Arabi. They say this is what they say, and they are haq. But we're speaking at the level of Aqul Mutawasita. At the, how would you translate Aqul Mutawasita? Average intellect. The, no, no, no. They're not mean the average intellect. They, they, not the intellect of the Sufis. The, the, the intellects that are, don't have the same epistemic breadth that the Sufis have. Let's say it that way. Very uh, important distinction because if that's translated as like ordinary man in the street democratically, it's a big problem, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it's a huge problem. Uh, and they won't like that very much either. Uh, no. you know. But the point is, is that they will say, Irawd al majood fi tahkik masalat al wujud of Khairabadi, Fazl al Khairabadi. Which is on the masala wahdat al wujud, as you were mentioning, he'd say this is the position of the Sufis, and we accept it. Do you know what he says? He says we accept it because there's ijma on their on their kashf. There's ijma of the ummah on that. And he says, but most people will understand that, so I'm going to discuss it on the aqul mutawassila, and that's how we discuss it. That was all of them. Brilliant. Absolutely everybody. So I think for us, it's very cheap. Now, why, why, if, you, if you say to most people that grew up in the, in the UK, who's Suyuti? I know Imam Suyuti is a great Imam of Hadith, radiallahu anhu wa 
Who's Nawawi? Everyone knows, mashallah. They won't know Sheikh Shafi'iya, by the way. Don't just say Muhaddith until they realize he was Ashari and then they get really upset about it and say, oh, we don't like you now. And then that's happened to me in life. <coughs> I sent a passage to one brother where, where he's talking about both of Allah's hands are right, right? Allah's yadain. Uh, there's a hadith about it and Imam Nawawi says the reason why the Prophet has mentioned that is to, to highlight the absurdity to believe that God actually has a corporeal or a physical hand, ma'asha. You know, ma'azallah, right? And that it's a, it, this is a metaphoric statement. So I sent it to somebody, and you know, who's mashallah very learned uh, in certain circles. And I said to him, what do you say about Imam Nawawi? And he goes, akhta. So I said, Nawawi akhta. Yani sadaqta anta, yani man anta, yani ma'ayna anta. Now what is, what's going on here, right? But the, the, we know these names, why? Because of the petrol dollar money that funded all of the books published in the 90s that were very cheap. We know the hadith scholars. So that's why when someone says, oh, did you know Ibn Hajar said this? <laughs> you say, oh, wow, I accept that. No, we said this, oh, I accept that. So you said that, oh, I accept that. Why? Because exactly. those are the names that you've been exactly. listening to. Exactly. Whereas Beautiful the names point. we haven't been hearing are... Can we are... put this on YouTube? Can we just have an active thought of that, please? <laughs> so, Beautiful. Yeah, but it's true. And the, and the, but the names that we haven't been hearing, hearing are Ibn Arabi, Ali al hijwari our elders used to, they used to have the hawl every single year, right? They used to have that, you know, they knew who that was and they used to recite. And everybody used to get upset from the young Pakistanis. Oh, they're getting up reading Saif al-Muluk. But they're singing all the Sufi kalam. Oh, the Babas got up reading Saif al-Muluk. Now everyone sat there saying, wow, Saif al-Muluk, <laughs> amazing. Like, but you lost that you kind of munkatir from that tradition of, of Punjabi Sufi kalam. My point is, is that just because we ain't heard the name, it doesn't mean that it's not, whereas actually, if you actually started to scratch the surface of your own tradition, you realize these were the forerunners that mm -hmm. kept Islam, or made Islam what it is, Thank and transmitted it to us. So exactly. forgive me for that saying. That's beautiful. I just thought, there's a lot of young people here, and I think it'd be beautiful for them to realize that these Imams are our Imams, not just the ones that we've only had.